in the a angle. Okay, so I'm going to take this. Turn that all the way down. Okay, and hopefully that will be all right. Yes, yes the Zoom Sorry. gods are with us. We hope. And how's that sound going? Do we have the YouTube? YouTube. So give me a thumbs up on the YouTube account. No YouTube. YouTube is up, thank you. And we've got audio on YouTube. Okay. 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 Um, okay. All right, well, thank you for bearing with us while we, for the first time in three years, have any technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next uh, week, we have another special Wednesday night at the lab as is some fun. Uh, next week, we're going to be at a special place, which is a new addition to chemistry at 1101 University Avenue. And we're going to have Catherine Jackson, who was, gave a talk here on the glass blowing back when she was a faculty member here. She's now at the University of Oxford in the uh, UK, but she's uh, here in the U.S. for some glass blowing meetings, and she very graciously agreed to give a talk along with Tracy Dyer, and that'll be next Wednesday. We'll probably start a little late for three reasons: technical difficulties, <laughs> technical difficulties, and to give people a chance to move from here over to there in case of conflict and technical difficulties. Uh, so I'm looking forward to her talk. I just want to emphasize we're going to have a Wednesday night lab next week. It's not going to be here. It's going to be there at the chemistry. And I can't think of the, I think it's S429. That's off the top of my head, but I think that's uh, the room number. All right. So I think I could do that. Would you like to come up for the introduction? Okay. okay. So we're going to stand right here because it's and can uh, you guide us as to whether people can see everybody on the camera? Because the only camera is that little green no. dot there. I can't tell if I'm on the screen or not. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to do a little formal like part. Yeah. Is this, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin uh, Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, I'm delighted to have a special Wednesday Night at the Lab as part of the Wisconsin Science Festival. And we have three artists here with us tonight. And uh, Sharon Tang is going to give the talk. And then uh, Alicia Rio and Amy Zaremba. Zaremba. Her last name begins with a Z. Yeah. I feel an affinity. <laughs> great. So I'm going to ask all three of them the five questions. This will be interesting. First, and you can answer any way that you want. <laughs> Remember, it doesn't have to be true, it just has to be believable. <laughs> and here comes the first one. Sharon, where were you born? I was born in Hong Kong, Rhinelander, Wisconsin. You're a Hodag? I am a Hodag. <laughs> in upstate New York. Where in upstate New York? Uh, born in Westchester, Westchester County. That's pretty close to the city, though. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And where'd you go to high school? Uh, Riverdale in the Bronx. <laughs> Tomahawk, Wisconsin. You moved. Uh, Delmar, New York, outside of Albany. <laughs> and where'd you go for your undergrads and what did you study? 
I went to Colgate University and I studied art and Russian studies. Uh, I went here. I studied studio art and English literature. Yeah. Uh, Suni Onianta and I studied fine art. Onianta is the first time I've ever heard that pronounced. I've seen it and, and read it many times. Oniata. I had no idea how to pronounce it. <laughs> and she's from Oneida County, which is like Onianta. Yeah. <laughs> And then for if you um, have done advanced degrees, where did you go and what did you get it in? Oh, boy. Uh, I, <laughs> I uh, completed my master's in speech pathology at Loyola University in Maryland. And then I started a PhD here at uh, UW-Madison. And I'm currently in the cell and molecular biology program. Thank you. Well, I have a law degree from uh, DePaul University in Chicago. Yeah. I uh, passed the bar in Wisconsin, but I wanted to do art and stuff. I passed the bar in Wisconsin too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You went past. I usually go in. <laughs> School of life. All right. Thank you. This is going to be great. Uh, Sharon's <laughs> going to give the talk. And then when Sharon's done, uh, we'll have a panel of three. And we're going to, the topic is the mural that was just officially dedicated today. Uh, at four o'clock across the street at the Discovery Building. And would you please join me in welcoming all three to Wednesday night at the lab. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Tom, do I speak into this or straighten the computer? Oh, both, okay. So if you wanna put that on. Uh, oh boy. That and is it on? I don't know. Well, there it goes. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. I think I'm, I'm mic'd up. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Sharon, as Tom beautifully introduced, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about how um, Amy, Alicia, and I came together to design and produce this mural, which is a pretty cool project that's currently over at uh, the Wisconsin Institutes of Discovery, so the WID. And so we came to this project initially through a public call um, that was put out by the WID, Wharf, and Moorbridge Institute um, as part of a, a program through Science to Street Art. And so uh, as part of their request for a mural, they would they wanted a uh, mural featuring the past, present, future of diversity in the sciences in Wisconsin. They also wanted this mural to identify lesser known and lesser celebrated contributors, um, even many who are anonymous or unsung heroes. They were hoping to identify women and BIPOC scientific figures from the past and present. They wanted to amplify science and educational resources, highlight research at WID and Mortgage, and basically provide science literacy through the fusion of art and science. So that is a pretty hefty list. Oh, sure, yes. Uh, close this up. See, that there was we go. Off your oh, easy. All right. So back to the big long list. Uh, so we had a pretty long list of things to consider when designing this mural. And they also provided us another document that really listed a, a large population of scientists. Um, that they wanted to be featured, but also they mentioned that there were other uh, themes that they wanted included too. Some were uh, land and agriculture, environmental stewardship, uh, the idea of children being a part of the future and the idea of um, having uh, the environment be a place that they can grow up in. So we had a big bucket list to fulfill. And as part of designing this mural, we were meeting with a panel of scientists um, based across UW, but mostly focused at uh, Witt and Morgridge. And these scientists really span um, the whole spectrum from research scientists and staff scientists working on microbiome and soy bi soil biology um, to graduate students and postdoctoral fellows working on the 
neurobiological modulatory feedback of songbirds in, in murmuration flocking organization units. Um, we spoke with some scientists who worked with zebrafish and did a lot of imaging. And we even um, spoke with a virologist who showed us a new discovery of a viral machine replicating uh, protein. And so we had a really broad spectrum of people that we were speaking with to also incorporate some of their research ideas into uh, our mural design. So where do we start? Uh, we had quite a bit of, of information to really distill. And luckily, um, I've worked with Amy and Alicia for the past several years, and we've collaborated on several really large scale projects that have um, successfully integrated large amounts of information or large contributions from community members in order to be able to cohesively form a, a final product. And so we felt like we were up to the task, um, but we wanted to do it in layers. So we figured that with so much information to um, incorporate into our design, we wanted to guide the viewers in processing and digesting some of these concepts over a period of time and do so in layers so that it's not all jumping out at you and, and competing for your attention. And how are we going to do this? Well, using the, the, the space and looking at the challenges of working with uh, the current space and, and trying to figure out how best to convey our design, we wanted to use vibrant color. We have this really, really large atrium, but actually a small surface to work with. So if you see on the screen here, that white panel in the middle of that wooden wall was the size of the mural. It measured four feet tall and 13 by 13 and a half feet wide. And so while that might seem relatively large, um, in a really, really large space, it looks quite small. And with the amount of things that we wanted to jam pack into our mural, uh, it was going to be a challenge to try to balance everything out. And so what we wanted to focus on was using vibrant color to really pull that pull the audience into uh, looking at the mural, whether it be from far away at a distance or really up close. Uh, we also wanted to bring historical figures to life. We had that big long list of um, well-represented but also really underrepresented scientists that uh, we wanted to feature and, and make more well-known to the public community. And then we also wanted to use patterning and imagery to introduce the concept of um, layers and all the different science concepts. And finally, one of the big ideas that I really wanted to integrate uh, was leveraging technology in order to be able to give audience members a deeper, um, a deeper dimension into interacting with the mural. But the big problem was, was that we've never actually used QR code technology in any of our murals. So in theory, um, we, we this was this was going to be a fun time. In theory, first I had uh, experimented a little bit with um, QR codes and how they might be able to be modified ever so slightly to be used in visual imagery. So this was really just a pilot prototype of um, trying to see how far I can push the QR code, which is a really rigid, you know, straight line box that needs to be able to be read by technology to be functional. And so um, some of my prototypes used, played around with how much contrast or lack thereof could I get away with in order to still maintain that functionality of the QR code. And also how much, um, how much of that box-like shape do I need to keep also in order to be able to uh, keep that functionality? Because the fun part about integrating QR into this mural was the idea that I didn't, we didn't want it to be very blatant uh, that there were QR codes smattered across this mural. We really wanted it to be embedded so that it would be kind of a surprise for our viewers. So luckily, I'm glad to report that this was a success. So playing around with all the QR codes um, and in these two images, we've got a QR code embedded into kind of that bacterial growth in the Petri dish in the center. And there's also that same QR code in, in 
incorporated into that cone uh, patterning. And so it was interesting to play around with how much of the, that square anchor in each of those corners needed to be there and how much of that anchor could we surround that QR code in order to camouflage it a little bit. And so that was a little bit of a trial and error, but I was just really pleased that it worked mm -hmm. because uh, I think that that was just a relief. We were, it was a little bit of a cross our fingers and, and hope situation, but glad to say that we were able to include the QR codes because it really does bring a um, extra dimension to the theme of our, our mural. And so tackling this design. Now, some of the challenges I mentioned were um, Part of the space, trying to engage the viewer in such a large space, but also a small space within that large space. Um, but also another really big challenge that we were working with was a, a timeline. So we needed to complete a design in two and a half weeks to try to incorporate all of these concepts and having to talk with um, our panel of scientists and digest all that information and turn it around to produce a mural that would be installed. Um, I think it was at that point only two and a half months in the future. So we were working on a pretty tight timeline. And so we tackled the design um, pretty much almost simultaneously as a group of three. So we really focused on trying to hammer out the portraits and figures of the scientists that we were going to include, um, the colors in the background, and then also the science patterning and QR code. So really this was like a trifecta of, of attack. <laughs> But I'll start with explaining um, our thought process and our intentions with the portraits and figures. So as part of our research into the list of scientists that we were provided, we really um, dived into some of the, the photography and, and the depictions of these scientists that, who were working in their labs. Um, and we have figures who are very well represented. So such as uh, Howard Temin and Hector DeLuca who are very well known on this campus because they've got buildings and paths named after them. But what we were really also uh, hoping to focus on were scientists who are less lesser known or, or under-recognized. So we've got um, quite a few scientists uh, from Wisconsin who have contributed major things to the advancement of science. We have Jesse Price who uh, is over in the, the top middle picture, she was a one of the first veterinary microbiologists uh, who developed a vaccine for avian diseases. And we have Thelma Estrin right to the, the top right corner. She was a uh, one of the leading pioneers in integrating um, computer sciences with healthcare. So kind of the, the birth of bioinformatics back in, I don't, I don't quite recall the year, but um, part of trying to distill and merge all this was on a really short timeline means that we were trying to process all their stories uh, in the best way possible. Uh, and then we've got Estella Leopold over in the center bottom, um, who is daughter of Aldo Leopold, who is also very well known in the area. But you know, coming into this as an artist and a scientist myself, there are a lot of names that I personally didn't know of. And um, it was really fun to look into little bits and pieces of the history at, as far as, you know, what, what time uh, was allowed us to, but to be able to learn a little bit about other facets of science that we aren't commonly exposed to. And finally, we've got Elizabeth McCoy over in uh, the far right bottom corner, and she developed um, or she developed a, a way to manufacture penicillin uh, in a way that it was able to be mass marketed. So um, just a really fascinating uh, collection of scientists. And this isn't, this isn't all, it really, um, it's only a small sampling, um, but I wanted to focus you on, on the fact that we chose some of these, we were drawn to some of these photos because of the joy and, and excitement that, um, that they express in, in their pictures. Uh, however, we first started thinking about, well, what do we want the viewer to see? And while we did want them to see the excitement of scientific research, we also really were more compelled by, um, for example, the picture on the, the top right where Thelma Estrin is bending over into a really old, I guess, computer 
it must be a computer, but really old uh, computer machinery device thing that is very, very large. Um, but we were really compelled by this, this imagery of being so invested in what they're doing and really participating in, in their scholarship. And so we kind of did a little pivot and started looking for imagery where our scientists um, were in the process of doing. And so whether that be in the process of teaching or in the process of research or just in, in a natural process where they're not looking directly and posing for the viewer, we started really uh, co co collating or collecting that's the word, collecting images of scientists just really heavily invested in, in the process of exploration. And so from that, we started also looking at how these um, poses of exploration just translate into general um, body language of discovery. Because part of the, the big push for this mural was not only to feature uh, scientists that are known and also underrepresented, but a really large part of this mural is also featuring scientists who are um, unrecognized, people who we might not know about yet, or people who are currently in the process of, of doing research that we don't know of yet. And so a large part of our um, our scientist composition it consists of anonymous figures. And we wanted our audience to be able to see themselves as part of this interaction of exploration and being a part of the sciences in that way. And so some of these are our doodles that we started throwing together to try to see what conveyed that, um, that message best. And we started cobbling some of these together with our science uh, portraits, scientist portraits that we have found. And we started to play around with what we wanted the, the space to hold and how it was going to read. So in this kind of tiny rectangle that's supposed to represent our mural space, uh, we threw out ideas such as having um, a more left to right narrative. So having a, a timeline narrative where on the left we have more historical figures and then it progresses towards the right into more contemporary scientists. Um, and we also tried looking at overlaying some of these uh, scientists in the process of doing and trying to get a sense for what might work in a relatively small space. Now, what we immediately were really drawn to is that big um, female scientist figure over on the right and looking at um, trying to fill up some of those spaces in her in her figure, in her, in her body, because we know that um, we all stand on the shoulders of, of, of giants somehow. And that I, I think it, it lends well to that, um, that, that thoughts, that philosophy. So we also threw out an idea where we, in, Perhaps maybe we incorporated some of the anonymous folks um, in a single layer that wove through the, the mural. And so in the beginning, a lot of it was trying to play around with space and composition and who to in include and how to include them and where they all fit into this picture. So while we were tackling the portraits and figures, uh, because of our short compressed timeline, we were basically simultaneously also trying to troubleshoot and, and figure out the colors and background. And so um, we first started looking at this idea of layers and imagery that conveyed a sense of layering. And we talked about looking at geological layered structures. So everything from um, rock sediment layouts to uh, core, the earth core uh, cross sections and skin and tissue sections. Uh, we even kind of played around with the idea of uh, movement of cells in that, in that swatch over on the top right. Um, so we really talked about conceptually introducing uh, some of the concepts that we learned about from our scientists, you know, maybe thinking about uh, arranging the background in a murmuration organization or trying to build in some pieces of their research. And we started throwing ideas around into, um, into our framework. So looking at some of these drawings as part of our process, you can really see how we started 
going very literally uh, by looking at, at geologic formations or even cloud or water, things that look layered that we could potentially use to be able to, to weave in so much of that information that we wanted this mural to include. Um, we have lake topography that we toyed with for a little bit, knowing how uh, prominent lake sciences and the, the core lake identity uh, we have here in Madison, um, all the way to just looking at, at the movement of, of lines throughout the space. And one thing I think we talked about as a group was that um, with a lot of these these images, the layering is very horizontal and static. And we wanted to give a sense of more movement throughout the background. And so as we were talking about uh, trying to integrate some of our science patterning into this background of layers, we really started talking about it more figuratively as a landscape of science. However, talking about it figuratively actually led us to really then processing it and, and translating it into a literal science or landscape of science. And so we really um, fell upon drawing from inspiration from the landscape of the Driftless region and settling on a, a, an image that both gives us layers to work with, but also more movement across the, the, the canvas or the wall. So starting from here, we wanted to then play around with colors and see how that might work into our, our concept. Um, we really wanted bright, vibrant colors to fill up that space. And so this was kind of our first go at it. It looks very busy. And we started also throwing together some of our um, figures and scientists and how they might fit into this background that looks really busy. And as we started going and, and um, changing things in, in kind of an iterative process, uh, we started simplifying the background to still represent that scientific landscape, um, but also for it to be a little bit more manageable on the eyes. Because while we're doing that, we're still trying to figure out where all those scientists are going to go. So we started playing around with, with really introducing um, not only scientists, but also some scientific equipment, um, tools that scientists use, and really the idea of um, exploration and, and scholarship. So you can see we're starting to refine a little bit more. And as we move on, we can see that we're, we're moving some of the figures around, making some smaller or bigger, um, playing around with what the eye settles on. And we kind of settled on this, um, this being our our base because um i think this gave us a really nice balance of both featuring the scientists and also featuring the anonymous uh folks relatively equally i think we did uh, a, a tally on who we we're representing and uh, making sure that it was a balanced um roster and so while we were kind of going and tackling those pieces, we also had the big task of trying to figure out where all this science was going to go and all those QR codes. And so after taking some time to distill all the research that um, we were introduced to by our panel of scientists, and also looking at the kinds of research that, uh, that was happening at the WID and Mortgage, um, We've, I, we, we boiled it down to broader umbrellas so that we could tackle on some of these science concepts as larger themes. Now, um, focusing on environmental or ecology as a field, that came pretty easily as far as getting the landscape, a physical landscape of science. But we were also able to incorporate um, some features of uh, limnology and the lakes, the, the topology, the, topography of the lakes into some of these, um, into some of the science patterning. And so you'll see um, sections where um, not only do you have the literal represent, representation of a lake in the book on the top there, but if you, if you peek on over to kind of where the, um, the binding of that book lays, there's actually a, a disc 
um, a round disc that looks like it has a checkerboard in there. That's called a Secchi disc. And that's what's that's what lake scientists use to measure lake depth and clarity. So, so I've been told. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I, I, for one, believe our lake scientists. <laughs> um, but so in, in distilling some of these uh, other scientific fields um, that are a little bit less tangible, I started doing some, some doodles to try to conceptualize what could be integrated into patterning that, that, um, that we could fill into our mural. And so for microbiology, um, one of the things that came to mind was different kinds of microbes, um, different fungi and the shapes and, and bacterial conjugation um, and, and things that really hearken to microbiome or soil sciences that were uh, tied to a lot of the research at WID. So from these rough doodles and sketches, uh, we were able to translate that into um, areas in the the background landscape that holds some of these concepts. So for example, on the top right there, um, we've got bacterial conjugation. So that is a mode of bacterial um, replication. And we've also got um, representation of microbiomes where, uh, which is really a polymicrobial community that exists um, cohesively and that's represented over on the bottom right, where you can see different kinds of bacterial or, or microbial shapes. Excuse me, not quite bacterial, but microbial shapes. And finally, in the, in the image over on the bottom left, there's actually a um, representation of virology. It was that uh, viral replication machinery that's represented in um, that bulbous circular curve area in the purple. And then over in the yellow, we have a uh, replicate plating, which is a, a microbiology technique uh, that was discovered by Esther and Josh Lederberg. So really trying to incorporate not only scientific concepts, but also uh, contributions from scientists too were incorporated into some of these uh, patterns. For cell med medicine and health, um, some of my doodles really focused on uh, looking at different types of cells. So everything from neurons to skin cells uh, to intestinal lining cells and um, translating that into different merged areas. So it's not necessarily, we didn't focus on having the patterning uh, stay in their defined realms, but we really wanted to incorporate and integrate a lot of these concepts um, throughout so that it wasn't necessarily static and siloed in a way that sometimes research can be. Um, we wanted to really emphasize the, the uh, potential for interdisciplinary collaborations. And so this was also one way to do it. And so up here on the top, it's a little hard to see on the, on the big screen, but um, there's a tiny little heart embedded into uh, a cell membrane area. And then on the bottom, there are areas where you can see neurons and uh, connections between uh, neurons and circuit board uh, imagery to really inform kind of the bioinformatics and, and health sciences that we are relying more and more on. For molecules and molecular biology, um, we've got straight up molecules, um, some things like vitamin A or warfarin as a molecule uh, was incorporated into our mural to really highlight uh, contributions from uh, our scientists. And also um, more abstract imagery representing um, amino acids. So really basic components of molecular biology that uh, are then incorporated into some of these areas into our mural. Finally for, well, not finally, almost finally, uh, technology and tools. Um, really, I thought about the patterning of circuit board wiring to uh, represent the idea of, of computing and the fact that so much of science uh, relies on, on, on computers we rely on computers nowadays, um, but also more, um, more physical tools like uh, this pipette that's represented on the bottom. It is a piece of equipment that helps move small amounts of liquid 
um, from one container to another. So um, the idea that that um, incorporating imagery that represented tools and technology that's that's shared among many fields of science and not just um, you know specific fields of science. And finally, um, oh, <laughs> and uh, being able to translate that into the mural as well. I on the on the far right in that narrow strip, you can actually see a silhouette of one of those pipettes I was talking about. And there's actually five hidden pipettes in our design as well. So not only are we looking for QR codes and scientific concepts, but there are there are a couple of Easter eggs in there that uh, you know you can see, especially once you get up to the mural. I know it's a lot harder to be able to see through a digital um, translation of the mural, but once you're there in person, it would be hopefully way easier to be able to, to play and find some of these concepts. And finally, um, another more abstract idea of representing science and the idea of um, scientists organi organizing their thought and their data. Um, I, I used imagery of phylogenetic trees, which are ways that scientists can look at classification um, and how things, how closely things are related to one another, or even just the abstract thought of, of um, like net idea networks and being able to represent that in a um, more of a, a pattern um, into the mural. So with all of that, uh, we've settled on our final design. And again, I, I recognize that it's a little hard to pick out all the details, which is why I highly recommend that you go visit in person. I'll give a little plug for that. Um, but in our final design, we were able to include quite a few um, historical and historical and contemporary uh, scientists from Wisconsin uh, that have really contributed uh, notable notable innovations or, or work uh, to our landscape of science. And not only are we representing the scientists in a figured, figured in a literal portrait, uh, we're also representing additional scientists uh, through, through the patterning. And so we have so many contributions interwoven throughout the entire uh, mural. And that's what the, the QR codes really, really shine for. We wanted to be able to not only feature these scientists and their and the history and their contributions, but to also allow viewers to be able to learn more and access more information as they appreciate the mural. And so I know I'm not going to do the best job at explaining what every one of these scientists have brought to us, um, but this gives um, UW kind of a hand in being able to tell that story. So these are where all the nine QR codes are located. It's a little bit of a spoiler. So I'm trying to not, um, if, if you don't wanna know, close your eyes. Um, but I did wanna point out that um, some are more obvious and easy to find and others you'll really kind of have to search for. And I think that brings a component of viewer engagement that makes it really fun and interactive and allows you to kind of take your time to experience this mural and discover it over time. And as I mentioned before, there are also those five hidden pipettes. Again, if you want to experience this in person, close your eyes. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to point out that there are in fact five and there are, they are the um, in the shape of that hand pipette, of the micro pipette that I had shown earlier in my doodle because there are kind of uh, several kinds of pipettes and pipetting techniques that are uh, displayed here in the mural. Some are a little bit more dated and we don't use them so much anymore, um, but others, you know, we still use. Regardless, there are five pipettes and uh, it's a lot of fun watching people search for them. So I just wanted to make a plug for that. So finally, we have our design completed and approved and now we paint. So I'll talk a little bit more about the process of actually putting this mural together. Now, we didn't, paint our mural on site. So we weren't stuck over at the WID um, late at night trying to, you know, navigate around uh, students or staff or scientists. We were able to really um, do this remotely off site. And we painted this in Amy's um, home studio. Uh, and we did this on a material called polytab fabric. 
This fabric allows us to paint and prime and um, basically hand paint just like you would right on a wall, but it allows us to then affix it to the ultimate you know, final surface. And it and the glue that we use actually pulls that fabric in so that whatever texture there is on the wall, um, the fabric actually follows that texture. So if you have a brick wall, we can still use this fabric. Uh, in the end, it'll look like that is following the ridges of the brick and, and um, appears to be painted, the mural appears to be painted on the brick wall. Uh, luckily for us in the WID, because it's interior and um, they have this nice smooth surface, we weren't too too worried about in, in installing this um, because that's it gets tricky once there's more surface texture. But in the meantime, um, this is kind of the, the first um, the first view of our, our mural. What you can't see in this picture, and I apologize for how dim the, the picture is, um, that's because what we were doing was um, working on this mural during nights and weekends. So typically we would be um, trying to paint this anytime between 8 p.m. and midnight over the course of about two weeks. Um, so it, it looks a little bit dim, but this is what we got. And what you can't see in this picture is the fact that we have a lot of um, the, the figures actually already projected and traced out onto this image. Now, we transfer our design by basically desaturating the entire design. And, and when you do that, you can see just how busy and how much information mm -hmm. is packed in there. Um, and so in order to be able to transfer all of this in a in an efficient way, um, we decided to kind of tackle it in a in a two two step approach. So we projected this image, but only traced out um, the main figures and the background colors. And then we were going to once that dried, then go ahead and and reproject some of the finer details of both the figures and the patterning. And so this is just a little time lapse to show that um, this looks like we did it pretty fast. And actually, to be to be truthful, this was probably the fastest portion of our production process. Um, between me and Amy, with Amy painting about six to eight hours one day, and then the two of us painting together for about four, say, hours a second day, we were able to um, fill out the complete um, the complete surface of the mural with the base colors and be able to represent the 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 bigger pieces of our portraiture and our composition. Makes it look easy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so this is our final, um, final background part done. And some of the, and, and it, it looked easy in that time lapse, but actually what we didn't see was a lot of um, multiple coats. So some colors tend to lay a little bit thinner and um, will require multiple coats um, and others less so. So all in all, we were able to get all of our background uh, painted in a span of two days. And from there, we were then able to tackle on the problem, not problem, the delightful challenge of getting our QR codes onto that backdrop that we had just painted. Now, um, we did not hand paint each and every individual QR code. That would have taken up two weeks all on its own. Uh, but we did employ a process used in printmaking. And so what we did was, if you look over on um, the top left, um, we used our design to measure out how large um, a QR pattern would be in our real life mural. And we were able to then transfer that QR patterning, as you see on the bottom in the black and white image, um, transfer that patterning into a real size uh, version of that QR code. And then we were able to um, collaborate with uh, printmaker Yvette Pino, who unfortunately uh, couldn't help us do the printmaking because she was moving to North Carolina and we were very sad about it, but she was able to help um, help us make the screens and guide us through the process. And so um, once the QR code patterning is burned onto that screen, we have the screen and it's a little bit like um, 
well, we put ink into the screen and then we are able to drag the paint to fill in the spaces and transfer that image onto a surface. That sounds really simple. But we learned that it actually was not. <laughs> and so um, over here, these are these are just a couple of pictures of our screen printing process. Over to the left, you'll see that we have marked up in blue masking tape on our backdrop um, where the screens should be aligned in order to get that QR code to exactly where it should be. Um, you can see on the bottom of that that picture that there are um, screens containing different QR codes. And so we were we were juggling, I think, more than nine QR or more than nine screens. Even though we had nine QR codes, we had um, several replicate screens just in case. Um, but we were really juggling to, um, multiple screens and, and making keeping track of which screen goes where and um, knowing which screen got which color to lay on top of it to make sure that contrast was preserved so that it would maintain that functionality once we screen printed. Um, and we were doing this all on a vertical surface. And so <laughs> this was really a truly a team effort where um, one or two people here in the middle uh, of photo, you see Alicia, you know, desperately pushing that screen on to maintain a flat surface for, for her life. And then, you know, Amy or I would then scurry up with, with paint and try to squeegee and transfer uh, that QR imagery onto our uh, backdrop. Now, as we've learned after the fact, <laughs> uh, this was a lot harder than anticipated. Our surface that we were working on had a little bit of, of ridges and bumps here or there that, you know, when you're trying, just like with a stamp, if you're, if you're trying to press an impression onto something and it's not flat, you won't get that perfectly smooth surface. And so there were a couple of QR codes that I then had to go back in and manually hand paint. So there was a little bit of hand painting, but by far and large, we really tried to rely on, um, on art science, on efficient practices. And so over on uh, the far right image, you can see one of the QR codes um, successfully imprinted uh, into kind of that telescope section. Um, it's that dark area. Um, and that's probably my favorite QR. So I just wanted to <laughs> just wanted to point that out. Um, but we we cheered every single time we successfully got a QR code to work. We were pretty close to giving up, I think, a handful of times, but we we stuck it out just like any good scientist does. <laughs> so once our QR codes were printed on and dried, we went back and reprojected some of those finer details. Uh, over the rest of that, um, the rest of the mural. So here's where we really traced out all of that science patterning, all the fine lines and the, the smaller figures. That's when we went and um, filled out those spaces. And this is where probably the bulk of our um, painting time went was, was doing some of these finer details. You would think that painting larger surfaces might take more time, but actually it's the fine detail work that took us, I think, about a week straight of night times and weekends. Um, but we were able to basically wrap up the entire mural in a total of two weeks. And so, once we had that mural painted and, and ready on our polytab fabric, um, we were able to then just hop on in over to the WID on a Saturday morning and install it, which also sounds like a very simple process. And we make it, we make it look simple. It looks like we're just unrolling and, and gluing up wallpaper. And it is a little bit like that. Um, however, um, the glue that we work with is an acrylic gel medium and um, we have to lay it on pretty thick. So you'll see us kind of pulling back and having to redo sections um, because it's a little bit like, I'd like to think of it as, as trying to make a really smooth layer of peanut butter and getting all the edges and nooks and crannies and trying to get a nice even layer. 
And so once that was on there, we, we had a couple of things that we had to troubleshoot. One was the fact that um, since we were working in the dark for two weeks, uh, we weren't anticipating how much um, glare and sunlight being in a really beautifully windowed building would bring onto our mural. So once our, our mural was painted, we had clear coated it um, with something that had a little bit more of a, a satin sheen. And in this setting, um, with that peanut butter attempt of, of trying to get a nice smooth layer, you could actually see dimples and divots um, reflected off in, in that lighting. And so what we had to do was uh, we had to then, once the, the mural was mounted up onto the wall, we then went and got a matte coating to then coat over our satin clear coat. And that actually, that successfully fixed the problem of seeing all those little lumpy bumpy divots. And it gives us a nice, flat, beautiful surface, um, which we had totally planned for and intended. <laughs> And so following, um, following all of that work, um, you can see that we also built a frame around the mural uh, just to, to really hold it into the, the space. And uh, with that, I wanted to say that um, this was, you know, for sure, not a small feat, but as with all big feats, um, a lot of hands went into this. And so I wanted to say a really big thank you um, to Wid, Wharf, and Morgridge. I know there was a lot of planning and help and support that got us here. And especially I wanted to list out um, the team that helped us handle logistics. Um, Andrew Hannes has been a really, really big um, help with, with helping us get this up and in its new home. Uh, Laura Heisler from Wharf, Laura Red Eagle, they were doing a lot of um, coordination for us. And then a, a full list of all the scientists that um, gave us feedback and contributed um, their research and put a little piece of themselves into this mural. Uh, big thank you to all of them. And so with that, I'm going to open up um, our panel of Amy and Alicia to join us, and then um, we can go ahead and ask some questions. Oh, we get to see if this is working. Mm -hmm. uh, no. no, if you'd like to speak in the microphone, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Is the light on right now? Try it now. Can you try it now? And does yours work? That's how well you were projecting. So that microphone was on. And is this one working? Questions? And um, Sharon, would you like to field so um, I can get out of the way? We can repeat the question. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're going we to move it around. Are we going to lose the. Yeah. Okay. That's your microphone. Yes. And I have a question. <clears throat> about, uh, so the question was, um, what was the reaction to our painting as far as the QR codes and reaction to Chuck Close paintings? Is that correct? Well, the, yeah, did Chuck Close have an influence on QR codes and paintings? Oh. Not hmm. that I'm aware of. Yeah, I, not that I don't I'm aware of. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. I can see why you connect mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, some really awesome and beautiful work. I really appreciate Sharon taking us through all of that, just how much detail and intentionality went into the mural. Um, I was wondering, just like as three individuals who are bringing different skill sets to this mural, if you could talk on kind of each of your expertise. Um, and then also there was a 
something you wanted to add to the email, but you couldn't get in there. Okay, so the question was, um, what do we bring expertise wise into this collaboration or how, how do we work with different expertise skill sets to collaborate on a project like this? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that question was if there was something we wanted to add to this mural that we weren't able to. Hi. <laughs> um, I guess for me doing, um, having a long experience um, with mural work and theater work and all that, making sure that it would read um, from someone on the other side of the building coming through that they had something interesting to look at and also something interesting for people right up close. So taking into consideration those two very different points of view. Um, and I just wanted to add that Alicia has over 30 years of experience in, <laughs> in uh, theater, uh, backdrops or mm -hmm. and and mural painting so she's she pretty much has seen it all <laughs> <laughs> um well i i want to add to it too alicia kind of came in with a lot of the the really quick like we'd be talking and she'd have sketches and i can't even get my brain to like wrap around a sketch for another week and she's giving us all these images it was amazing <laughs> to have that to start from because we need to see the visual and sharon and i are talking and talking and talking. But I feel like my role ended up often being the one to say, no, like, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of <laughs> editing, but that's just kind of what I end up doing. And the color, the color was, we're going to use purple and we're going to use red and you're going to like it. <laughs> um, and we and, did. And, and, we did. Did. Yeah. and you did. Yeah. See, I was right. I, wrapped, I, I learned to like pink too. I, I'm calling it pink. <laughs> she usually calls it light red. <laughs> um, but but Sharon was, um, I mean, you can speak to what, what you brought, but um, we wouldn't have applied for this project um, if Sharon um, hadn't been so excited about it and and it been such a perfect fit for her mm -hmm. skill set mm -hmm. and having the knowledge and the ability to understand what scientists were talking about. Uh, we couldn't have done any of that. Like that was, you know, that was what she brought and and that especially, made this happen yeah especially with such a short right. tiny oh, tiny tiny timeline um we could have spent a year on this design easily i mean the three of us could have together but um doing it alone if we we hadn't had um someone like sharon well specifically sharon not someone <laughs> like you, you. <laughs> yeah um <laughs> there's absolutely no way that we could have even wrapped our heads around mm -hmm. one individual that's represented in that mural let alone all of those specific people and all of those contributions and then the more general mm -hmm. um landscape of it it just mm -hmm. it required that that knowledge that broad you know, scientific mm -hmm experience and knowledge is incredible. Yeah, I guess that that's the pretty obvious contribution <laughs> I make. I bring some of the, the background of the science and um, we've been working together for the last couple of years on, on multiple big projects. And I think we just work really well as a team. Mm -hmm. We bring different things to the table, but in a way it, it synergizes mm -hmm. the, the end result. I don't think we're competing or there's no friction. It just, we're able to put our ideas into the pot and somehow it just, it all fits together. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish I could be a little bit more descriptive as far as how yeah. that ends up fitting, right. but it just naturally does. So and there's, there's, there's also um, no ego play right. amongst yeah. the three of us, which working with many different people over many different years and I'm sure in the scientific community too you know you get those egos that it has to be you know someone's idea and strong personalities, strong personalities. Yeah. and um, it's just really exciting to be able to bounce ideas mm -hmm. off of other people and be okay with someone say really no <laughs> nice idea and maybe next time but we are not doing <laughs> okay 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 so that's a good segue on was there anything that we wanted to incorporate that we didn't 
And I can I can speak from myself. I personally feel no because we put so much into mm -hmm. such a small space. Mm -hmm. um, hiding those five pipettes was really kind of my the, the nice little Easter egg. I mean, those did not need to go in there, but I just really love that they are because it gives people a way to interact, not only through technology, but really kind of um, without technology as well. Anything you guys wanted to add that didn't make it? Mm -hmm. No, there was nothing. I mean, it was hard to decide what was going to because there was so much. So we mm -hmm. still had to do a lot of editing. So all the individuals, the, the specific and the more anonymous, it was really hard to, to narrow that all down. We had you know, some that mm -hmm. we couldn't put in there. I mean, there was nobody specifically, I think that we had to remove or didn't include that, that I was really like, you know, upset about, but, um, but that was hard to make those decisions. Yeah, uh, that sort of reminded me in the highlights for children magazine in the picture mm -hmm. so, very strong as that, yeah. for that concept mm -hmm. you're yourself like yeah, <laughs> they still make those <laughs> well, I was say, um, the dedication today if i understood correctly there's going to be changes in the theme from time to time in the QR yeah. Code. yeah, so that's part of the process that we didn't talk much about. So for the nine QR codes, we're we, you know, I've I've worked with um I guess committee committees, just vague, vague committees that I'm not really sure who is who and what is what, but um working with a whole slew of people to generate content for nine separate QR codes currently, um, because it is really shared by Wharf, WID, and Mortgage, the fact that there are nine QR codes works really well because each of those entities has taken three. And um, they are able to then feature um, elements that make sense for them to really uh, push forward. But I know that there's also been talk that if there were a special event, you know, one of those three entities could then take all of the QR codes uh, for a duration of period. And so what's really wonderful is that um, I, I feel as though as, as artists, we know that the QR codes are in good hands and that they're really going to be putting uh, the content generation to, to good use and being able to feature educational material for people to, to find um, or just more information on, on the backstories of folks or even feature current scientists that are working and, and being able to promote um, inclusivity in that sense and um, understand how what scientists look like nowadays for people who don't work in the scientists and being able to make that connection. So really giving the university um, a portal to really be able to dynamically rotate what they want to feature was an exciting concept because then that makes the mural not static. You know, it's not something that you look at once and then you get tired of and you've already seen it. It changes with the seasons, with with new research, with, you know, things that that, you know, are important to be seen. So I think that's that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And with it also representing the future, there's no way that we would know, you know, what's gonna come about in five years. So that aspect is there for it to keep um, being relevant. I would like to know more about the actual materials used, both the the base fabric mm -hmm. and the nature of the paints. I'm assuming you were using something along the lines of acrylics mm -hmm. um, for just ease of, of mm -hmm. managing them. Yeah. Um, but I'm really curious about that base fabric as well. That's a wonderful yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll keep the question first. So our question was um, just generally wanting to know more information about the materials that we've used, uh, specifically that polytab fabric, and whether we use acrylic paints and what the nature of um, our, our our paints were. Mm -hmm. So Alicia, you can you can okay. this one. <laughs> so the material that we have been painting on is called polytab. It's actually interfacing. So it's a material that's used in the um, in the clothing industry, so stiffening for collars and so forth. And a clever fellow, Kent Twitchell in Los Angeles, who's a mural artist, discovered that it is 
a really good base for mural work in painting. It's inexpensive. Um, it doesn't shrink or warp. Um, it's a non-woven polyester type so it's material. Fire. Yes, yes, it's non-woven. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. It comes in five foot wide whips on big rolls and it accepts paint beautifully. And we can even use it um, on exterior buildings. So we can wrap an entire building or we can do an inside um, painting. It's just incredibly versatile. And so um, we've been working with that material for large scale murals um, at, for me at least for 10 years now. The, the, the guy who started, it's been like 40 years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. over 35 years. Um, it's been in use as a mural fabric mm -hmm. um, for me personally, um, 10 plus years or so. The paint uh, we use on this project is Nova. It's an acrylic um, company out of California. They make their paint. It's a high quality um, acrylic, also um, able to be used for exterior murals, but it gets beautiful coverage, yummy colors. It's getting it is uh, it yes. is in our world sure it is. um and then the varnish we ended up using is a modern masters dead flat varnish and that just really brought it down got rid of all the glare and the glue the glue okay we permanently glued it to that surface uh with acrylic gloss gel medium and that's the same glue that we can use to um, adhere the polytab fabric to exterior walls as well. And it, there's no bleed through. No. Mm -mm. But there's a lot of layers. We prime the polytab first, and then there are a lot of layers of paint on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it almost ends up feeling like a vinyl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can roll it without cracking the tube. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. Yeah. You need to yeah. you need to roll it on a tube. You can't. Yeah, you can't Hold crease it. it. You can't crease it. It's the crease. No, mm -hmm. well, um, but yeah. Well, so one of the one of the elements that is evident in your wonderful presentation here and production is uh, what I think is an important element of art, and I wish you would just sort of comment on it. But it's the emotional component of what you produce in the eye of the viewers who come to that particular film, mm. and uh, mm. I, I always feel that art has has a very should, good art has a powerful emotional mm. element to it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you uh, and you put a lot into the design to evoke that emotion and the color and so on. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So the question um, is, what are our thoughts on on how we evoked emotion um, in this piece? Is that a pretty good summary of the question? Anybody doing? Yeah, anybody walking into that moment, seeing that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are they gonna? What yeah. Are they um, I think. What, what do you want to sense in, inside when you see that? Uh, Alicia briefly touched on this a moment ago, talking about what what she brought to the project, and um, the, it's what we talked about from the very beginning. Was it's such a big space? You walk from from such a far distance, and that mural feels small to us. We're used to working much bigger often. Um, so there's there's kind of an intimacy in this this big space, but you want that person that's walking in the door from that far away to feel something, to want to come closer because there is so much hidden in there. So what we used to get to get that was the simplicity of those lines, those those dark lines, and the color. The color is just that's what what screams to me that that's what I hear. Um, and that's what would would draw me from across the room. And, and it's, there's a balance in finding um, that saturation where there's those really vibrant colors that draw you across the room, but being able to walk up close to it and not be um, overwhelmed by it. Um, so, so having kind of that gradient, the, the 
really those bright, vibrant ones from across the room, and then the more subtle colors when you got close and having those patterns in that subtlety and, and kind of flowing through that background. And the familiarity of a landscape, I think, does a lot. There's something about that that feels um, welcoming and, and home-like to me, at least. Even in those vibrant colors, I still, I still feel that, that landscape and that, mm, I don't know, just the natural feeling that, that kind of ties it all together and weaves it. Does that make sense? Do <laughs> you have any more? Mm -hmm. No, there's, there's one in back. Um, was there always a consensus that the mural would be placed in that part of the compounder, or was there like different ideas for the various designs? Mm -hmm. So the question was, was there always consensus for that spot being where the mural was going to go? That Yes. <laughs> so basically, when we came um, to the project, that spot was already selected. We actually, when we first read um, the description, we thought it was going to be the entire wall. So we thought it was going to be that entire wooden space. And we had grand plans on really, you know, incorporating all of these scientific concepts and big ideas. <laughs> and then we realized it was going to be that itty bitty, bitty white space during our interview, <laughs> during our interview for, for the selection process. And we're like, oh, all of these concepts might be a little too much. Um, but as we were working through it, we, we realized that we, we still managed to hit all the things we wanted to do in a bigger space, but, and, but made it manageable for that smaller space that was selected. Yeah. Um, how would you finally Settle on the theme of the driftless uh, area rather than some of the other ideas you toyed with. Uh, so the question was, how did we settle on the driftless landscape as the background theme instead of the other ones that we were playing around with? Um, okay. Well, we we did we toyed with a whole bunch of different different landscapes, and I think uh, Sharon briefly mentioned this. A lot of them were very um, horizontal. It was it was layers just kind of stacked, and when we started building on top of that, it it didn't have that organic feeling that I was I was talking about. That it was yeah, it was stripes, mm -hmm. and and putting the colors together, you just had one color on top of another color on top of another color, but this landscape it it had so much more form to it that that moved. And it brought um, it brought different colors next to each other in a way that that didn't didn't give it those stripes. It 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 was more interesting, um, and it's it's an area that's just it's it's beautiful and and Wisconsin, and we could claim it as as a Wisconsin landscape as well. So it it just when we when we hit on that, it was right. It was just right. Like we knew it when we saw it, and it, it fit, and it it did all that we wanted it to do, and held all of that. We were looking for something that could hold all of that information in a way that was graceful, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, what inspired you to do the documentation of the whole project from start to finish? So, the question is what inspired us to document the whole process from start to finish? This. <laughs> well, suppose, like, Alicia says this. Um, I, I suppose we pretty much regularly try to document all of our projects from start to finish. I think there's something um, really exciting to watch as far as ideas grow from 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 nothing to design to then watching it transform and then to building it into a reality that changes the space. I, I really love the sense of how art can change a space. And so I love documenting the whole process from before to during and after. I think I think a lot of it was unintentional too. A lot of what Sharon was showing us were sketches that that we shared back and forth and and those build and you know, we just don't get rid of those. <laughs> um, but the the time lapses and and a lot of the photographs, as artists, we have to constantly be self-promoting too, mm. um, to get more jobs, to, to continue our careers. You have to keep track of that stuff and share it with people. And and right now, um, on a lot of social media, people want to see videos too. So that that helps us in you know future future work. It's it's also easier to um, visually present how things are done, the process of it, as opposed to trying to explain it with words. 
there's just really, you know, um, it, it's just so much easier to explain visually mm -hmm. what what we do with something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. use something like Adobe Illustrator or Procreate or any of mm -hmm. the electronic forms of diagramming, drawing mm -hmm. to share ideas back and forth? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the question was, do we use um, digital software like Adobe Illustrator or Procreate to share our ideas and design the back and forth? Mm -hmm. And we each um, had iPads that we were using Procreate. Um, so when we would um, get together at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> with all of our iPads, um, we were actually able to yeah. project it on Amy's big home television screen and doodle in real time. Yeah, and talk yeah that was great. Ideas and then, mm -hmm. you know, pass photos to each other, airdrop, and it's to be able to do something like this before the technology that we have now would have been really, really tricky, especially with that tight timeline. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to just share photos and drawings, um, you know. At any time of day. At any yeah. time of day. <laughs> <Sleep night. laughs> So you said you've worked on other projects before. Is there anything nearby that we could see that you have done? Oh my goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was, uh, have we worked on, uh, we've worked on other projects before. Have there been other projects that we can check out or not we, because we we know what we we've know. worked on, but <laughs> that others can, can uh, check out. Should, should I answer? No, no yeah. can start. Oh, sure. Uh, I think one of the more recent ones that is really big and easily um, viewable is the uh, three panel My Arts Center mural. So My Arts is the Madison Youth Arts Center. Center. Mm -hmm. um, and they just have this brand new building uh, and opened it in the summer, the, yeah, July. grand opening in the summer. Yeah, and um, since the three of us worked uh, together closely through Dama Projects, which is a, a local arts nonprofit, up until recently they were known as Dane Arts Mural Arts, and now we have rebranded into Developing Artists, Artists Murals, Murals and, and Alliances. Alliances. Mm -hmm. But regardless, Dama. Um, is the acronym that that uh, we can easily remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we've worked on multiple projects through Dama, this was a Dama project that Amy here designed mm -hmm. actually. And uh, it's also really similar. And I think that's what gave us the inspiration for using a lot of this layering and QR code imagery in some ways, um, because that mural is located on Ingersoll and DC Swash. Mm -hmm. And if you get up close, you can see that there's actually a lot of, um, maybe you should be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a project that, that we had started. Um, we were, it's community, community art. So we had planned to have kids like local, local youth paint with us, but it happened, it began during the pandemic. So we had to figure out a way to incorporate their contributions. Um, differently than we had expected. So kids actually did drawings based on different themes, parts of the mural, and we screen printed them onto the mural. So that was kind of where we got the, maybe we can do QR codes with screen printing because we have screen printed on a mural. It was much different on that one. But um, so if you see the mural and you look at it from a distance, um, it has uh, big organic um, abstract shapes and, and bright colors. And if you get up close, you can see actual kids' drawings um, creating the patterning in the mural. So that, that gave us some of the, the actual um, technique that we were able to use on this project. Um, there's also... There's uh, the... Almond. 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 Oh, yes. Uh, it's uh, just south of Stevens Point. There was a project that we all worked on together. Um, Rhinelander? Rhinelander, Wisconsin. We did that together, too. Yeah, that's a, a big one. Um, Janesville? Janesville. Oh, um, we just finished one in, <laughs> in Janesville um, that is for a... Um, a free um, health clinic, uh, Health Net of Rock County. It's a big giant project that wraps around a corner and it's 
um, similar similar colors um, and some some style connections to this project as well. But we we all worked on that one too. So basically, we've got quite a quite a representation of work all over all mm -hmm. over Wisconsin, but that we've got quite a few in Madison as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.